my name is Ashley Dugill, and I'm joined by Emily Guymont as well. Um, we're going to be presenting for you today on a few public meetings, public records, and ethics topics. Um, my name is Ashley Dugill, like I mentioned. I specialize primarily in public contracting and also land use, whereas Emily does more employment and real estate work. But of course, as uh, city attorneys, we do a little bit of everything public entity related as well, including these topics that we're going to be presenting on for you today. So for goals for tonight aren't necessarily for you to become an expert in these topics, but more just to be able to gain tools to be able to recognize key issues as they arise, and then to either come to us or reach out to OGEC, which we'll give you a little bit more detail on later, and ask for assistance. Um, like I mentioned, the main discussion topics for this presentation are your authority to act as a body and when you and the scope of that authority, public meetings, public records, and government ethics laws. I'll be covering the first two, and Emily will be covering the second two. So first, source of authority. So there's main two there's two main sources of authority for your ability to act. Um, this is legal authority, which you can find in statute, charter, ordinances, policies, et cetera, and also uh, the number of individuals within a particular body. Typically, you need a majority or a quorum in order to act as a body. Uh, generally, neither the charter nor your municipal code grants powers to individual members of a council or boards or commissions to act on behalf of the city. As such, members are expected to abide by decisions of their body, whether or not they have voted on the prevailing side. So it's really be careful when you're speaking publicly that you're um, clarifying if you're speaking on behalf of the body or if you're speaking on your own behalf. And also remember that unauthorized individual actions actually make you personally liable. Um, you won't uh, fall under any sort of city uh, protection or any other board protection. Uh, so scope of authority. Uh, your scope of authority to act um, as an individual and as a body really depends on your individual code and policy. Um, it's important to be able to check your code and then fill in the details of that by creating uh, policies on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, your charter actually requires the city to adopt your own individual council policy, but, uh, in connection with city council at least. And the city did do that in resolution number 1227. Uh, planning commission scope is also established in your municipal code in chapter 2.24, and boards, commissions, and committees have general authority limits that are established in this subsection of your code as well. So moving on to public meetings. So generally public meetings in state law are addressed in ORS 192-660 and the following statutes. And this states that elected and appointed officials must meet in public to make on or deliberate towards decisions. The purpose of the statutory series and just in general, the public meetings rules is to encourage transparency in the government and your affairs. So the people who are subject to this law are the governing body of the public body. And this is really just all of you. This is city councils, county board of commissioners, school boards, planning commissions, park boards, and even citizen groups and subcommittees that are formed to advise or take certain actions on behalf of these public bodies. If you do have a public meeting, there are certain key elements that are really important to keep in mind. Um, the first two are advanced notice and also certain considerations that you should have in mind when you are considering the location. Uh, for advanced notice needs to be reasonably calculated to inform interested persons. Uh, and usually this is at least 24 hours in advance. Personal notice also has to be given to those who request it. And the advance notice must address the principal subjects that are going to be discussed at the meeting. As far as location, it should usually take place within your jurisdictional boundaries, uh, with some exceptions. If you're meeting with another public entity, it can take place in their jurisdictional boundaries and some other exceptions. Um, also, more recently, you must allow for a remote option for people to attend. The location also has to be of a sufficient size to house the expected or reasonably anticipated 
uh, number of individuals that will who, that will be attending the meeting. So not just the number that ordinarily attend. So if a meeting is particularly or expected to be particularly controversial or particularly popular, you know, this might change um, the size of the location on just a case by case basis. And then finally, it needs to be non discriminatory and accessible. So the location can't discriminate based on race, creed, color, sex, age, national origin, or disability. In addition, there are some requirements for voting and minutes or record keeping. Uh, votes need to be tallied and attributed to each member of the governing body. You cannot have secret ballots and a majority is required in order to pass a motion or pass um, any matter before the public in that meeting. Minutes also don't need to be verbatim, but they must contain the essentials. Under some circumstances, audio or video is enough, but that really depends. Um, and also actually executive session records must be made and retained, but they don't necessarily have to be disclosed. And I'll be covering more on executive sessions later in this presentation. Control of public meetings is also really important. Um, the public has a right to attend and observe, but not necessarily participate in public meetings under state law. And sometimes local rules allow for public limited public participation. For example, public comment periods are pretty common, um, though it's important to make sure that if you are allowing public comments that the standards that are applied apply equally to everyone um, who is in uh, participating as a member of the public. So for example, if you establish time limits, those time limits should be the same regardless of who is speaking. Also, you may not remove a member of the public from a meeting unless you can actually clearly demonstrate that the individual is disrupting the meeting in a manner that precludes your board commission or council from conducting business. Um, this is a tough one. And really we typically advise that unless there's a physical disruption, an inability to continue meet your meeting, um, you should avo avoid removing members of the public from a meeting or potentially could simply end your meeting altogether. So those are the legal requirements for actually holding a public meeting, but when does a public meeting occur in the first place? So state law addresses public meetings in two key ways. First, all meetings of a public body must be in public. And second, a quorum of a public body may not meet in private. And those are the two uh, subsections of state law that, are, that reference this. So I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail of this definition and kind of break down the key elements for you and show you some um, situations that would be a public meeting and also wouldn't be. So first, here's really that definition um, stated in another, another way, which is that a meeting means a convening of a governing body of a public body for which a quorum is required in order to make a decision or to deliberate towards a decision on any matter. And you can see I have those key aspects of the definition um, highlighted, and I'm going to go into a little bit further detail on each of those. So first, what is a quorum? There's always some minimum number of members that must participate in order for a body to transact business. And this is the quorum of that body. State law does not define quorum, but it instead defers to local law to be able to decide that. And for Gladstone in particular, uh, for your city council, a quorum is for voting members. This is also true for a number of your other public bodies. It's also important to remember that subcommittees of a body are also governing bodies in and of themselves. So they have to abide by public meetings rules and also a quorum, um, the, the, the same rules apply for a quorum for them as well. So another aspect of that definition, um, when is a meeting convened? Um, a con when a meeting is convened, um, it's important to remember also this concept of serial meetings. Up until very recently, um, serial meetings was only codified or communicated to the public through uh, case law. But last year, it was finally codified in state statute uh, through House Bill 2805. Serial meetings occur 
when a series of communications, so multiple communications over a period of time, um, either directly or through a third party happen and you discuss, deliberate, or take action uh, with a quorum of the public body present. So to kind of illustrate that a little bit more, you can see this definition of convened that is now in state law. Um, a meeting is considered convened if the governing body gathers in a physical location, that makes sense. Um, also, if they use electronic video or telephonic technology to communicate contemporaneously, which just means in the same time at the same place. So if you're all on a video call, but you know there's a quorum, um, that is still considered convening. Um, third, here's that new aspect, uses serial electronic written communication. So this means that over a period of time, you were communicating electronically and a quorum of your public body used that electronic means of communication that creates a public meeting. Or you use an intermediary to communicate. This means that you're using a third party to communicate uh, topics that should be discussed in public instead of in private. There are some exceptions to this. Um, really, they, off, they most of them boil down to this final aspect of the de definition, which is making or deliberating towards a final decision. Um, these are not considered a meeting, even if a quorum of public officials are present or if a quorum of public officials are convening. So on-site inspections of any project or program are not considered a meeting. Also attendance at any national, regional, or state association to which your public body or the members belong. Social gatherings, as long as you keep it social, you avoid any discussion of official business at that social gathering. And then there are some specific exceptions to the serial meeting uh, requirement. So you can have uh, conversations with a quorum or through a third party. Um, as long as those conversations are purely factual or educational in nature, they're not related to any matter that could be foreseen to come before your body, or they're non-substantive. So they're kind of the same as that prior subpoint. They're just not likely to um, be material to your, your public body or be something that they would be deciding on. Okay, and then executive sessions. So this is a situation where, this is one of the only situations where you may have all the key elements of a public meeting, but nevertheless, you are still permitted to meet in private, subject to very specific um, set of requirements and circumstances. Uh, the definition of executive session is any meeting or part of a meeting of governing body that is closed to certain persons for deliberation on certain matters. So... Um, one of the very first things to that's really important to remember for executive sessions is there's a really limited specific list of reasons why you can hold them. And unfortunately, there's no easy way to remember this. It's just important to remember that it's, it's very specific <laughs> and to either ask your city attorney or look them up yourself. Um, they're all listed in ORS 192-660 sub 2, and there's 16 specific instances for which you can enter into executive session. Some of the more common ones are real property transactions um, to discuss public exempt public records, to discuss pending or threatened litigation, employees, labor negotiations, or safety and security. And the public body can still choose to hold an open session, even when the law permits you to hold an executive session. So for any of those, if you wanted to, you could still hold it in open session. So like I mentioned, there are really specific um, set of rules that you must follow when you are conducting or entering into or leaving an executive session. Um, first, you cannot take any final action in executive session. You can discuss anything that's permitted to be discussed in private, but if you are going to take a final action, you have to close that executive session and then re-enter into the public meeting before you can take that final action. Also, um, if you do, before you enter into executive session, you have to announce the specific subsection of the law through which you are entering into executive session. You have to cite the very specific reason rather than just making a general uh, statement. And then you also have to say whether or not you will be returning to public meeting. Um, also, if you meet an executive session, members should attempt to provide direction to consent 
or consensus to staff. All contact with other parties must be left to the designated staff or representatives handling the issue. And unless required by law, no member should make public the discussions or information obtained in executive session. It is private. Um, and then finally, press actually can attend, there, though there are some limited exceptions to this. They're able to use the information that they glean from the executive sessions in order to follow leads, but they cannot um, report on what they hear. Finally, uh, public meeting violations. So uh, any person can file a complaint with the Oregon Government Ethics Commission or OGEC for executive session violations. And liability, like many of these other situations, is personal. And OGEC can investigate, find a violation, and impose penalties. So that means that you personally would be liable rather than the city or your board itself. Uh, a civil penalty is up to $1,000 per violation OGEC can also issue letters of reprimand, explanation, or education, and even in certain extreme circumstances can invalidate certain decisions. Um, this is why we always recommend that if you have a question, you should re proactively reach out to OGEC. Um, they are there to help you and really answer any questions that you might have on specific scenarios. So to break up this presentation a little bit, um, Emily and I have some hypos for you all. Um, and these are hypos that just are uh, for public meetings in particular. I'm not quite sure how to involve um, the people who are listening in, but I might just pose this, let you think about it for a little bit and then provide an answer. Um, so the first hypothetical is about creating a public meeting and I'll just read this out for you. Uh, city council is comprised of seven members, the mayor, and counselors A through F, so seven total. Counselor B emails Counselor E to discuss an item up for vote at council's next meeting. Counselor E responds to B with her opinion and loops Counselor A in via a CC for his opinion as well. Counselor A responds to both counselors E and B. So did this create a public meeting? I'll give it maybe just like a couple seconds for you to digest all of that. So to be able to analyze this, I would go back to the public meeting definition, which is a quorum of a governing body may not meet in private for the purpose of deciding on or deliberating towards a decision on any matter. So the first step of that analysis is asking whether a quorum is present. In this case, you had three council members. You had Councillor B, E, and A, but there are seven members total. So a quorum would be four or more. So in this case, it fails at the very first step. This is not a public meeting because a quorum is not present. It doesn't matter what they were talking about. It was less than a quorum. All right, moving on to hypothetical two. City council is comprised of seven members, mayor and councillors A through F. The city administrator creates a group chat, adds the mayor and counselors A through F to the chat. So everyone is added to this chat and sends the following message. Does anyone have any schedule conflicts if we schedule the next meeting to begin an hour earlier? Did this create a public meeting? What if multiple counselors respond? Give you just a second to think about it. So the answer here, again, going back to definition of a public meeting, a quorum of a governing body may not meet in private for the purpose of deciding on or deliberating towards a decision on any matter. So the first question, is there a quorum? There is, there's seven, all seven are present. Um, they're of a governing body. They are, unfortunately, they are meeting in private, but what's the purpose? It's just to discuss schedule conflicts. Um, it doesn't matter if anyone responds or not. They're talking about something non-substantive, which is an exception for serial communications. So this is permissive. All right, last hypothetical. City Council is comprised of seven members, the mayor and councillors A through F. 
Counselor C initiates an informal virtual happy hour in order to improve camaraderie. Members of council can virtually drop in for a social chat with their fellow members. During one of these virtual happy hours with Counselor C, Mayor, Counselor F, and Counselor D are in attendance and the conversation topic strayed from upcoming vacation plans to the city's request for proposals for a construction project. Did this create a public meeting? So again, I'm gonna just go through the same analysis, a public meeting. The law says a quorum of governing body may not meet in private for the purpose of deliberating or deciding on or deliberating towards a decision. So in this case, you do have a quorum because you have Councillor C, the mayor, Councillor F, and Councillor D. That is four members out of a total of seven. Um, they are meeting in private. And although the prior purpose was a virtual happy hour, which is completely fine, a quorum would be allowed to attend social gatherings. Unfortunately, they did not keep the topic of their conversation to fun, non-substantive topics. They were originally talking about vacation plans, but then they started talking about an RFP for construction instead. So if they had kept their original um, conversation light and on um, social things, that would have been completely fine. But unfortunately, as soon as they start talking about the RFP, then they should have made it into an official meeting or ended that conversation um, as quickly as they could. All right, so just some key takeaways from this public meeting section. Um, public body members should refrain from using the reply all function on emails or group texts. Um, that's a easy way to accidentally create a public meeting. Public body members should also refrain from serial communications via email, telephone, face-to-face, -face, or even social media postings. And public body members should not use staff or other individuals as intermediaries or as people to go between, unless the communication meets one of those exceptions that I mentioned. Some final takeaways, what bigger picture? You should not make or deliberate towards making a decision with a quorum of your board or commission outside properly noticed public meetings. Executive sessions are permitted in specific limited contexts subject to certain requirements. And if you have any questions, we always recommend that you contact OGEC before you actually act. All right, this is Emily's section, so I'm gonna mute myself. All right, thank you, Ashley. Um, and thanks for giving us a great intro to authority and public meetings. Um, my name is Emily Guymont, as Ashley said. I'm also an attorney with Beery, Elsner, and Hammond. Um, I will be taking the last part of tonight's presentation. Um, we've got a lot to cover, so I'm gonna move a little bit quickly. Um, first up, we have public records. So there's there's four main points that, is, that are important for you to understand about public records. Um, Oregon's policy regarding public records, how public records are created, how public records should be preserved, and how public records must be disclosed upon request to members of the public. So um, Oregon state law strongly favors transparency in its government, um, and it recognizes that our self-governing system of government requires that the public be able to find out what our governments are up to. So for that purpose, Oregon state law requires, um, when public records are created, requires that they be preserved and then disclosed upon request. And so um, pursuant to that policy, Oregon's creation and preservation and disclosure requirements are very broad and very broadly interpreted in favor of disclosure and transparency. So. Um, the definition of public records is that any writing that contains information that relates to the con conduct of the public's business. So any writing means truly any writing. It doesn't matter whether it is physically written down on a piece of paper, typed into an email, typed in a text message, sent via Facebook or something like that. Um, if you create a writing that has to do with the conduct of the public's business, you have created a public record. Um, can I have the next slide, please?
Okay, so when public records are created, they must be preserved, they must be retained in accordance with a policy that is set by the Oregon Secretary of State. And so that policy is um, really just sets the, the timelines, so the number of years that uh, the city must hold on to a certain public record. And that number of years is depends on what that record um, contains, the kind of material that it contains. And it's a very extensive list that we don't need to go get into right now. And it really isn't any of your jobs to make sure that those records are retained. Um, your job is that if you create a public record by taking notes at a meeting or sending a text message or sending an email, your job is to make sure that a copy of that record that you create makes it to the city staff person who's in charge of retaining public records. And so that is uh, likely your city recorder. Could I have the next slide, please? So um, you all, as, as public officials, this applies to you, also applies to employees. It also applies to city volunteers. Um, and there are certain situations where it's easy to get yourself into trouble about creating and retaining public records. So um, we all text a lot these days. You email is ubiquitous. Um, and so those sort of like one off outside maybe the normal official scope of communications messages are very easy to lose track of. Um, so we all must be very diligent about making sure that we follow best practices, such as not texting or not using our personal phones to text um, city business and not using our personal email addresses either, if that could be avoided. So if you use um, like a city issued email address, it's much easier for the city on a systemic administrative level to keep track of the messages that you send. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I got, sorry, just got a couple more points before we hit this hypothetical and then we'll go through that. Um, so Oregon's public records real laws does not require that you create records. So there's nothing in the law that says thou shalt must, um, you know, type out every single note that you take during a city meeting, for example. But if you do create it, it is subject to the retention policies. Okay, so um, I'll do the same thing as Ashley here. Just read these really quick, give you a second to mold over and talk about it. Um, so counselor one uses her personal phone to text counselor two. That should already be a red flag for y'all. She begins by sharing her thoughts on an item on the agenda for an upcoming council meeting. So that definitely has to do with city business. But then she ends the text by describing her kid's soccer game. That definitely has nothing to do with the city's business. So the question is, um, the counselor deletes the text. Was that wrong? Is that text a public record? And the answer is yes, that text was a public record because it contained material that has to do with the public's business despite the fact that it also included material about the kids' soccer game. So the kids' soccer game is not enough to take it outside of the public record realm. So um, that counselor has uh, violated public records law by deleting the text. Next slide. Okay, so here's our takeaways. Um, make sure to preserve copies of any records you create. So uh, your job is to make sure that any records you create make it to the staff person who's in charge of keeping track of public records. Um, a good way to do this is to avoid non-typical communications like texts, using your personal cell phones or emails, using your personal email addresses. And then um, we highly recommend that the city have a policy for making sure any non-typical communications make it back to, make it back to the relevant city um, staff. Okay, let's jump right into ethics. Okay, so similarly to uh, Oregon's public records law, government uh, Oregon's government ethics laws are designed to make sure that there are transparency in the government process and to make sure that public officials are not doing anything to abuse the privilege that comes with the office of being a public official. So there are five main ethical areas that we're going to touch on today. Um, the first is financial gain. So using a public official using their their office for financial gain, um, how gifts may and may not be received by public officials, what conflicts of interest exist for public officials and how to handle it, um, the rules on nepotism and the rules on handling confidential information that a public official learns through the course of their position. Let's get to the next slide. Okay, so um, a word of caution before we start in on this, ethics questions are extremely fact specific. So whether a certain situation is or is not an ethical violation depends on 
things like who said what and when and where and why and the identities of the specific actors and all that good stuff. So it is not possible for us to give a presentation that will provide you with every single answer on every single possible ethical situation. This presentation is merely intended to give you enough information so that when you come into a situation, you can recognize potential issues and then know to go get help and where to get that help from. Okay, let's get a slide. So um, <clears throat> unfortunately, this area of law is rather definition heavy. So the first definition that's important for you to understand is public official. What is a public official? A public official is any person serving the city as an elected official, an appointed official, an employee, or a volunteer. Let's get a slide. Okay, here we are at rule one. Um, do not use your position as a public official for financial gain, which seems pretty common sense. And I'm certain that no one is entering their positions for the purpose of obtaining a financial gain, but we gotta go through the rules because they can be a little nitty gritty and it is possible to inadvertently put yourself in a situation that would be a violation. So um, the rule says that a public official cannot obtain a financial gain or avoid a financial loss for themselves, their relatives, their household, or their businesses, if but for the public official's position, they would not have had that opportunity to obtain a financial gain or avoiding um, a financial loss. Slide, please. So um, it doesn't apply just to public officials, it applies to their relatives as well. And here is the very expansive list of relatives as defined by Oregon law. Um, I will not read them all aloud to you because it turns into quite the tongue twister at some point there. Um, but just be aware that if you are related to someone by blood or by marriage, then you that person is likely a, your relative under the definition of relative in government ethics laws. Slide, please. And then um, the business with which a public official is associated applies as well. This is uh, also kind of a bit of a tricky definition. So um, a business is any private business where the public official or a relative of the public official is a director, owner, officer, or employee, or where the public official owns more than $1,000 worth of stock, et cetera, in the preceding calendar year, or any publicly held corporation in which the public official or relative is an officer or director or has the equivalent of a thousand, or excuse me, a hundred thousand dollars worth of interest. Okay. So, um, oops, sorry, let's go back one slide, please. And I've got, I've got an example here for you because this is kind of a tongue twister. <clears throat> Okay, so here are a couple of examples to go through this. Um, there's a counselor, a counselor has a daughter, this daughter owns a landscaping business. This counselor is associated with that business because that counselor's relative is an owner of that private business. Um, we've got a mayor who inherits $150,000 worth of Apple stock, lucky mayor. Um, Apple is a publicly held corporation and um, the mayor owns more than $100,000 worth of interest in stock. And so that Apple is a business with which the mayor is affiliated or associated, excuse me. Okay, slide please. All right, our second rule, um, gifts are limited. No more than $50 per year per interested giver. So uh, the rule is that during any one calendar year, a public official may not receive or solicit directly or indirectly any gifts that individually or cumulatively exceed $50 from any single source. So any single gift giver, if that gift giver could be reasonably known to have a legislative or administrative interest in that public official's actions. Next slide, please. Okay, so gifts in this context are anything that has economic value. Okay, so, um, you know, like a, a picture that your kid draws for you is certainly a gift, but wouldn't be a gift necessarily in this context. 
um, a gift that is given to the public official or the public official's relative or member of the household um, is given to the public official without the public official giving any sort of value back. So um, the public official isn't paying for it or exchanging anything for this gift. And it is not given to the general public on the same terms as it is given to the public official. So in other words, if the public official was simply just another member of the general public, the public official would not be getting this gift. The gift is given because the public official is a public official. Slide, please. Okay, and what is having a legislative or administrative interest? So the rule only applies to gift givers who have a legislative or administrative interest in that public official's um, decisions. And so that is defined as an economic interest that is distinct from the general public. So it is an economic interest that is specific to the gift giver that is not shared by just any old person out on the street in any matter that could that is subject to the decision or vote of the public official when the public official acts in the public official's capacity as a public official. <laughs> Slide, please. Okay, so not everything that a public official receives is a gift. So there are exclusions from the gift rule here. Um, this is a list of some of those exclusions, most, most of the common ones. Um, I'll let you review those yourselves, um, but anytime that you are given something because of your role as a public official, uh, regardless of whether you think it clearly falls within one of these exclusion categories, it's a good idea to check with your resources to make sure that it is okay for you to accept this gift. And your resources are, um, your city manager, um, us, and uh, as Ashley said, OGEC, the Oregon Government Ethics Commission. Okay, slide please. All right, we're on to rule number three, which um, has to do with conflicts of interest. So there are two types of conflicts of interest. There are actual conflicts of interest and potential conflicts of interest. So this definition here that we see here first is for actual conflict of interest. So a con actual conflict of interest is any action or decision or recommendation made by a public official that will have a private financial benefit or detriment for that public official or the public official's relative or any business associated with the public official or the public official's relative. And um, relative and business associated with have the same definitions as we previously discussed. So actual conflict of interest will have a benefit or detriment. Slide, please. And here we are with potential conflict of interest, which is the same except in one key way, potential conflicts of interest are any action, decision, recommendation that could, could turn out to have a private benefit or detriment to the public official or relative or associated business. So actual conflicts, will have um, a benefit or detriment. Potential conflicts could have a benefit or detriment. So uh, the law treats those two things in two different ways, um, which we'll get into now. Slide, please. Okay, so when you are faced with a conflict of interest, whether it is actual or potential, the law requires that you declare that you have a conflict of interest. Um, you have to state the nature of the conflict. Is it because you own a business that's going to be awarded a contract? Is it because you have a relative who works for a business that might be awarded a contract? You have to do this on the record so that it's recorded in your meeting minutes, which as Ashley said, are required to take for public meetings. And you have to declare it on the record before any voting or even any discussing of the matter happens. So you gotta do it fast at the outset and then on the record. And you have to do it at each meeting at which the matter is discussed. So if it's an issue that pops up across several meetings, you can't just declare it the first time, you have to do it every single time. All right, can I get a slide please? Okay, 
So that 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 declaring rule was for both actual and potential. And so here we are with more rules for actual conflicts of interest. So when faced with an actual conflict of interest, after declaring it, you have to be quiet. So you cannot take part in any discussions on the matter. You certainly cannot vote on the matter. And um, this is optional, but do consider physically removing yourself from the council table if y'all are in person and sitting together, um, just purely for the fact that, you know, image matters. Sometimes it could be a bad look to have an actual conflict of interest and then remain at the table while the vote is being taken. There is one exception um, to this rule, and that is if your, you as a public official, if your vote is required for the matter. So for example, if um, without, but without your vote, there wouldn't be a quorum. So your vote is required to take, make a quorum. Then you can vote on an actual conflict of interest. However, we strongly recommend that in this situation, if it is possible to delay the vote so that a quorum is, um, you can get a quorum without your participation, that you do so. Slide, please. Okay. Um, there is one more, I guess there's two main exceptions for um, this conflict of interest category. Um, it is not a conflict of interest if the financial benefit would happen because um, the public official is mem a member of a class as determined by the OGEC. So um, a class is a group of, in of likely uh, similarly situated individuals um, who are excused because of their similarities and their particular relationship with the topic that is the conflict is excused from the conflict rules by OGEC. However, um, this is not something to be relied on in typical situations. Uh, firstly, uh, OGEC must approve and create classes in advance of any conflicts of interest. So it's not something that you can do or get excused from after there's a conflict. Um, and it is rather hard to get a class declared. So if if there is a conflict that you see on the horizon and you think that a class may apply, we strongly recommend reaching out to OGEC well in advance to, to get their um, input on that. And the second exception is that if the conflict arises because of a public official's membership in a nonprofit organization, um, that isn't a conflict of interest, as long as it is a nonprofit. Okay, our fourth rule, here we are, no nepotism. <laughs> so under Oregon's ethics laws, a public official may not appoint, employ, employ, promote, discharge, fire, demote, or participate in any interview, discussion, or debate regarding the above um, for a relative. Next slide. Um, it's important to remember that the law doesn't forbid two or more relatives from working for a single public body, for working for a single city. It's just that the relatives cannot be um, involved in the hiring, et cetera, of each other. Um, and similarly, the public official cannot supervise a relative or a member of that household. Um, the main ex There are two exceptions to this rule. The first is that uh, if a relative or member of the household is an unpaid volunteer, if it's an unpaid volunteer, then the public official can supervise. Um, and then the law does allow public bodies to adopt a policy that says otherwise that public officials can supervise a relative or member of the household, even if they aren't unpaid volunteers, but only if a policy has been adopted saying that. Okay, so our fifth rule here do not use confidential information. <laughs> and I think that's a little bit self-explanatory. So um, under this rule, public officials may not seek personal gain using confidential information that they gain because of their official positions or the activities that they partake in through their official positions. Um, so clearly this is intended to make sure that public officials do not get a leg up just like with um, you know, financial gain issues, 
on the general public just because they are public officials. All right, let's do a slide. Thank you. Um, okay, so what happens if a public official violates any of these laws? So um, OGEC is the, uh, the body, the state agency that receives complaints. It's complaint driven. So um, investigations and penalties, if the investigations are founded, will be triggered by first by complaint OGEC. Um, OGEC will investigate and they'll make a finding. And if they find the complaint to be substantiated, then they can issue a civil penalty to the individuals who um, partook in the violation. And that civil penalty is up to $5,000. Um, in the case of violations that involve a public official gaining a financial benefit by way of an ethics violation, uh, OGEC can also order that public official to pay twice the amount of whatever that financial benefit was. So that could be rather hefty in some situations. OGEC can also issue individuals letters of reprimand, um, letters of explanation, and letters of education for maybe lesser violations. And it's important to note that any penalties and sanctions from OGEC are personal to the public official. So it is to the individual, it is not to the city, and the city certainly will not pay those fines. So, um, you know, for an individual person, the potential liability can be a little, little hefty. So we gotta be careful there. <laughs> and um, decisions made by a public body uh, as a result of an ethics violation are not necessarily voided. So not automatically voided by law, but um, as Ashley said earlier, they certainly can be. Next slide, please. And then, yeah, just a little bit more about OGEC here. Um, <laughs> so I just talked about how OGEC can be the bad guy, um, but they're also a very helpful body as well. So um, OGEC is the agency that's in charge of interpreting, issuing rules and opinions on, investigating um, Oregon ethics laws. So um, it issues rules and opinions, and the opinions are um, a helpful read, maybe not the most fun read. I We spend some time doing it as part of our job, so I don't know if I would recommend it for pleasure reading, but it's helpful to see how OGEC would address situations. Um, it provides trainings to public officials, which is good news um, because one of the changes in Oregon's public meetings law uh, in addition to the serial meetings that Ashley talked about earlier, is that um, there is now a public meetings training requirement for public officials. Um, at least, I believe it is at least once per term. So if you're elected to a four-year term, you got to go to this public meetings training once. And this, um, Ashley, feel free to chip in if I'm missing something or misstating something. I I think that's correct. It might be once a year. It might be okay. an annual training. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, we'll check on that and then I'll make sure that gets back to you with correct information. And that is new this year. So the obligation, whether it's once per term or once per year, starts this year. Okay, slide please. Okay, I've got a couple of hypotheticals for you guys too. Um, I will, you get to listen to me read them out loud. So I know how much time you <laughs> to give you to read these to yourselves. And then I've got... Um, multiple choice answers on the next page that I suppose I will also read out loud. Lucky everyone. Um, so here's the first one. Uh, a mayor attended the League of Oregon Cities convention and submitted a re reimbursement request form for travel expenses to City Hall. Uh, while visiting the city manager a few days later, the mayor sees the reimbursement form request awaiting her approval, the city manager's approval, with the unsigned check attached to save everyone trouble and time and as an authorized signatory on the city's accounts, Mayor Marks approved on the form and signs and pockets the check. Are there any eth ethical issues with the situation? Let's see the next slide. Okay, so we've got three choices here. The first one is no, no ethical issues because the mayor was entitled to her reimbursement she incurred those expenses traveling for city business, after all. Uh, second option, yes, there are ethical issues because the mayor used her official position to bypass the reimbursement process 
and sign her own reimbursement request. And the last one, no, no ethical issues because the mayor not only should receive reimbursement, but also deserves <laughs> extra compensation for conference attendance. Wow, I really hope the LOC con convention wasn't so boring as to require like emotional damages. Um, okay, so the answer here is number two, using that time old, the longer multiple choice option is usually the right one, um, fell right into that one. So the answer is yes, there is an ethical issue with this situation because, but for mayor's um, position as mayor and the power to be an authorized signatory on the city's accounts that come with that position, the mayor would not have been able to sign her own reimbursement request. So because she was able to, she derived a private benefit from her position that was not available to the general public. So the proper procedure here would be for the mayor to wait for the city manager to finish the paperwork and then um, receive her compensation check through that process. Next slide, please. Okay. A city councilor is invited to a large luncheon that is put on by a software company during a national conference. Uh, meanwhile, the city is in the process of soliciting a new software program. Once awarded, the contract will exceed the city administrator's spending authority. No business is discussed at the luncheon and the food is provided buffet style. So you grab plates and you go down um, those lovely food warmers, the big stainless steel things. Um, any issues with this situation? Look at the side, please. So I love um, number one, no, if you don't know the value of a gift, it doesn't count. I love that. Um, number two, yes, the counselor should identify the value of the meal and include it within her annual tally. So that $50. Um, if over $50, she must refuse the luncheon. Three, no, the meal is incidental to the convention. Four, no, it is not certain whether the software provider will be awarded the contract. Okay. So the answer here is number two. The counselor should identify the value of the meal and include it within her annual tally. If over $50, she must refuse. Um, and I, I like this hypothetical because it really illustrates how it can be rather impractical or just logistically difficult to keep track of the $50 things. How do you, how do you value a buffet lunch? Like, is it, is it a, a McDonald's buffet lunch? Is it a like steak and lobster buffet lunch? How do you assign a value to the amount of food that you put on your plate from a buffet? Um, that is very difficult, of course, but it doesn't excuse the obligation to keep track of that $50 gift limit. So in situations like this, the safest option maybe would have been for the counselor to go, hmm, well, we are soliciting bids for a software program. This software company is going to be a bidder. Maybe I should just excuse myself from the luncheon altogether because I am unsure whether it will exceed the $50 limit. But I do, I do still like number one. If you don't know the value of a gift, it doesn't count. You gotta close your eyes and get a free pass. Okay, next typo, please. Okay, I think this is our final hypo. Um, the city is making citywide adjustments to its zoning map in order to comply with state ADU requirements. A planning commissioner owns property anticipated to be rezoned. Any issues? Does your answer change if the individual voting is a counselor instead of a planning commissioner? All right, let's go to options. Next slide, please. Okay, so the issue with this hypothetical is conflicts of interest. And so the first thing that we need to do is figure out whether this counselor and this um, planning commissioner are faced with an actual conflict of interest or a potential conflict of interest. And if you remember, an actual conflict of interest is um, something that will, that is certain to have a private financial benefit or detriment to the public official and a potential conflict of interest is something that can or could have a private benefit or detriment, but is not yet certain whether it will actually have that 
private benefit or detriment. Um, so the hypothetical says that uh, the, the, air, the property that this person owns may be rezoned. Okay. And so it may be rezoned and who knows if it is rezoned, who knows what the financial impact of that property will be. Is it going to um, increase in value? Is it going to be zoned to a zone that would cause an increase in value, a decrease in value, or maybe no change in value whatsoever? So um, because we don't know, because the effects of that is not certain, this is a potential conflict of interest. So when we have a potential conflict of interest, the rule is that you have to declare, but you don't have to abstain from voting. So um, that takes out number one, because number one would have both declare, but not participate in discussions or vote. So that's not, that's not the answer here. Um, for number two, it would uh, apply different rules to the planning commissioner and the counselor. But that that is not um, both both are similarly situated in this situation. Both would realize that benefit or detriment, regardless of whether they were the planning commissioner or the counselor. Same thing for number three; it would treat both differently, which is not correct. So our answer then is number four because it's a potential conflict of interest. They both must declare as required, but then can participate in the discussion and then vote on the issue. All right, slide please. Okay, that takes us to the end. Um, I would solicit questions, but I don't think the video format that we're in right now would um, let that happen. So um, we are happy to answer any questions. Please feel free to call or email us with any questions. I think you are getting a copy of the slides after this ends. So if you take a look and you think of a question, please don't hesitate to get into contact with us. Emily, also, if, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, if I'm wrong about that, and there is a way for people to ask questions, please let me know, and we're happy to answer them now, too. Oh, yeah, of course. I will ask our city recorder if there are any hands raised. Um, primarily, what we were doing tonight was uh, recording this information, and we're going to send the link to all of our volunteers that weren't able to participate tonight. I love the hypotheticals that you guys go over in the different examples. And I know that in Gladstone, it's such a small community that our volunteers, they know each other, they hang out together, they socialize together. So it's just really a good reminder not to discuss city business when you're doing those things. Um, and I would say as a city administrator, the, the biggest one in regards to public meetings that I'm dealing with is reminding people don't reply to all. And it's just only reply to one person or reply to the staff person to take care of that. Um, but I wanted to thank both of you for putting in the time and effort in this. We also have the two documents that you guys produced, the Oregon Government Ethics and the public records and meetings that we can provide printed copies to all of our volunteers. Um, Tammy, does anybody have their questions? I do not see any hands up currently. Okay, great. So I think with that, we just want to say thank you again to both of you for the presentation tonight. And we will make sure that everybody gets a copy of this. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having us. It's a pleasure to come and talk to you about it. All right. Have a good night. You too thank as well. You. Good night.